Uh, hi everybody, my name's Helen. I work at Ramwick Council in the sustainability team and I uh, wanted to welcome you today. Uh, a very warm welcome to week two of Ramwick Council's Eco Living Festival. Yep, yep. And this week is all about bees, bugs and biodiversity. Today's event is Honeyland Film Discussion. And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Bidjigal and Gadigal people who occupy the Sydney coast being the traditional owners. On behalf of Bramwick City Council, I acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders both past and present and to the Aboriginal people in attendance today. So uh, today's session is being live streamed and is interactive. Uh, we'd love you to ask, answer, ask questions. Uh, so please put that in the chat and you'll have a, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion and then um, your questions will be answered uh, following that. Uh, so also after the session, just uh, if we hope you feel inspired to take further steps in appreciating nature and biodiversity by getting involved in some of yes. Randwick Council's current environment programs. So look out for those at the end. We'll share a, share a slide with those on and we'll also share a slide with a QR code that links to our survey. And we'd really appreciate your feedback uh, on this session. And uh, if you don't get a chance to uh, link in with the QR code, we'll also be sending an email, a backup email directly after the session. Okay, so uh, now it's over to our panel convener and panelists today. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to uh, our panel convener, Blanche De Winter, a communications consultant, a Cozzelli local who is passionate about cultivating community with an appreciation of the interconnectedness of all that is. So Blanche said, while she's not a beekeeper herself, she's looking forward to drawing out the knowledge of others and bringing people together to open conversation around bees and biodiversity. Thank you, Blanche. Thanks, Helen, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, some of you, most of you have seen the film, but a few of you haven't. So. Um, we're very lucky that we'll have a panel tonight that we can learn more about bees and bugs and biodiversity and also discuss the award-winning documentary Honeyland. Um, just it's, it's set in a remote area of Macedonia and tells the story of Hatija, who has learned wild beekeeping from her father. And just those traditions of wild beekeeping have been handed down over many generations. Uh, in the film, we see how... Hadija keeps things in balance. There's a really amazing scene in the film where I think it's one of the defining scenes of the film, in fact, where she says, let's have half the honey for ourselves and leave half for the bees. Um, we also see what happens when there's a family that moves in next door and they try to speed up the production for profit, essentially. They had um, an interested buyer who wanted more and more honey and um, that, you know, that process really was a very destructive process for the bees overall. Um, as well as Hadija's relationship with the bees, which was, as I said, cultivated over many generations, we see her lovingly caring for her mother. So it's very much a human story with strong themes of sustainability and how we must respect nature for our own survival. So um, another one of the things I just loved about the film was it was, and which you might find interesting if, if you haven't seen it, is that um, it was really filmed from a visually compelling perspective. Um, they really wanted the film to be able to be understood even without language. And they filmed for about 400 hours in this remote village. Um, and they could only be there for like three days at a time because there was no running water or no electricity. So it was quite um, a process to really capture the stories of Hadija and, um, as I said, what happened when the family moves in next door. That remote life might seem like worlds away from our busy urban lives here in Sydney, um, but I'm sure we can all be inspired by her example. And um, we're also joined today just to help ground this so that we can really get some of those key um, messages from the film. We're very lucky to have a panel of experienced beekeepers and people who practice sustainability who can share some of their insights, experience and knowledge with us. So 
what we'll do is I'll introduce them and then have a discussion with them where we can just learn a bit more about them and their interactions and experiences. And then as um, Helen was saying, we'd love to hear from each of you about your own thoughts about the film and any questions you've got for our panel. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce you to Lance Lieber and Sydney and Gloria Chung from Sydney B Club. Um, hi. hi. <laughs> Lance, I'll just sort of share a little bit more about you. Um, Lance founded Transition Sydney in 2009, which focuses on creating more sustainable communities and, is, and Lance is fascinated by science and the wisdom of permaculture, as well as having run hundreds of community events with hundreds of volunteers he runs an organic landscaping business and keeps various species of bees in the gardens he works with while creating habitat for various insects and animals aiming to restore urban ecosystems in Sydney. Great to see you, Lance. And um, you. Gloria. Gloria is um, a professional graphic designer and she's always been identified as an artist and social entrepreneur. She said that never in her wildest dreams did she imagine she would become a beekeeper. But after volunteering alongside Lance at Transition Bondi, she started beekeeping in 2017. And as well as being with Sydney Bee Club, she's the co-owner of Bee Friends Bondi. And um, Gloria, you split your time between the Blue Mountains and Bondi and where you're beekeeping and putting permaculture and sustainability into practice is really um, what you're about these days. So really excited to hear from you. Next, we have the lovely Kate Burton, who is the owner and founder of Queen Bee. Uh, Kate's business was the first company in Australia to make beeswax food wraps by hand. The journey began 20 years ago when Kate started rolling candles as a therapy for managing the anxieties of a high pressure corporate job and it worked. So we can't wait to hear more about that, Kate. Um, now you're, I've read that you're all about bringing realness and simplicity to our lives and in turn helping the planet. And, um, yeah, as well, you kept bees on your balcony. In, <laughs> so heaps to learn from you. Thank you. And then we've got Emily. Emily's um, decade-long career in environmental management, Emily Stroutons includes roles as diverse as carbon crediting in the heat of outback birth, bush regeneration, ecological consultancy and fauna monitoring projects spanning the entire east coast of New South Wales. Emily is a champion for our local native species, be it birds, bees or buds, but also recognises the importance of connecting people with nature. Through her role as Randwick City Council's bush care officer, she aims to empower everyone to play a role in building resilient, diverse ecosystems by supporting habitat in our homes and neighbourhood. So, yeah, great to have you all here. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So I thought, I mean, just to get the conversation started, it'd be really great to hear from each of you about your, any responses, any thoughts on the film, and also just a bit about how you became involved with beekeeping. So maybe Lance and Gloria, you two would love to start. <laughs> so my journey into beekeeping came out of the sustainability uh, from teaching permaculture and running a community garden. We needed bees for our pollination services for our plants and things. Um, so that's how mainly, that's what got me into beekeeping. But uh, especially, um, if you know, for those who've seen the movie, we'll see exactly how easy it is to get absolutely sucked into beekeeping because they're just such incredible creatures. You know, the whole super organism of beekeeping, um, the way that they operate as one organism, even though they're a hive of thousands of bees. Um, and then from getting into keeping uh, European honeybees, I also um, then started to learn more about the science behind it. And um, I kind of learned a lot from local scientists about how honeybees, uh, there's a saying that they say, keeping uh, honeybees to save the bees is like keeping chickens to save the birds. And um, so that's when I got into native beekeeping. 
Uh, so keeping them, you know, a few different species of native bees, and we set up habitats for all the other solitary types of native bees as well. Mm -hmm. Go next. Um, <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's, um, I started about four years ago, so I'm really feeling new. I think three, four years ago, feeling new beekeeper. And at the beginning, I remember I started because I was involved with the community garden, with involved with Transition Bondi, and learning about a lot from Lance. And I remember the first year, I was quite scared because <laughs> I'm so scared to get stung. And and I did have um incident where I didn't zip up my suit bed properly the bees got in and i have thing <laughs> bees stung on my lips so i have like botox but actually it's not botox it's a like detox it's a big lip yeah detox so the first year is quite um it's very interesting i enjoyed it but at the same time i was scared but along the way the more i learned about it um i remember one of my mentor uh actually from the uh, urban beehive vicky she said the more you get to know them, the more you inspect them, the less you're going to be scared of them. So then I do that more, and then now I'm not so scared of them anymore. And I found them very inspiring, very, um, in a way that another, another beneficial thing that I found the bees gave me is that, especially this time during the lockdown, I found them, um, it's quite therapeutic for me when I'm doing the beekeeping, it's almost like meditative um, process for me because sometimes I can spend an hour or two just checking out a beehive and that kind of help me just focus and it helps me with my mental health in a lot of ways. It's quite mm. therapeutic watching honeybees, mm. but also with multi bees, it's a different, um, different kind of feeling, but it's sort of, it's like you are in the aquarium, you're watching the, uh, the fish, you know, the swimming and with the bees, the same effect. You're watching them flying busy, but it just calm me, calm me down a lot. It's a very mm -hmm. zen kind of experience. Yeah, so Thank I you. highly recommend people to, um, yeah, keep, keep the bees. <laughs> There's even research that's been done to show uh, that it is therapeutic in patients who have terminal illnesses have better outcomes um, yeah. when they have the native bees in hospitals in Australia. Yeah. It's very interesting stuff. Mm, great. Thank you. And Kate, what about you? You you had a similar experience with the therapeutic benefits of um, working with bees and it started with the bees wax for you, didn't it? And rolling yeah. Handles? So for me, I had severe panic attacks and my GP told me to get a life and pick up some hobbies and candle making was one of them. I was already interested in, I guess, sustainability and non-toxic living. I probably came at it more from a natural, non-chemical way of living. Um, so I already knew about beeswax and those were the only candles that I used. So those were naturally the candles that I made. And then I think as you just heard, you you know, from Lance and is, is, did you become a little, the bees are quite obsessive. Um, I'm one of my closest friends in beekeeping is a guy called Bruce White, who was the Apri, or the Apri's officer at the Department of Primary Industries for 43 years. So if there's anything to know about beekeeping, Bruce would know it. And very early on, probably 15 years ago, I did a beekeeping course, which Bruce taught. And then I desperately wanted bees. And so we put two beehives on my apartment balcony in Neutral Bay. I was lucky in that I lived opposite a park and so as the bees flew straight out from the beehive, the closest building in front of me was probably 50 to 100 metres away because um, there was a big park in between. And I had those, I think, like everyone else is talking about, I was initially quite scared of bees. Bruce is <laughs> extremely... Like Bruce can Bruce just beekeeps without a veil, without a bee suit. 
when he opens a beehive, the bees are like, oh, Bruce is here. G'day, Bruce, mate. And the bees are just so gentle. And I think he is so calm. Bees are very, very reactive to your mood. So if you are tense, then bees will be more tense. And if you are calm and relaxed in your movement, bees will be calm. And I think you see that with Hadija in the movie. She's just, I found her really childlike. She's so naive in her approach to life and her approach to beekeeping and her approach to the bees. And ultimately, I think if we all approach the environment and bees in that way, I, I know that beeswax still surprises me here at Queen Bee. So I, I have zero balance in my life. I probably work 70 hours a week, which I absolutely love. And still beeswax surprises me. I've been doing this for 20 years and I will still be surprised by it. Um, and I'm always saying to my candle makers, you need to approach candle making with humility. And I think it's the same with beekeeping. You approach a beehive, which is a super organism of, you know, 50 to 80,000 bees during spring and summer. And you approach that with humility and be calm and gentle and observe. And now I need to breathe and give someone else the opportunity to talk because otherwise I'll talk for the whole hour. <laughs> it's the, the passion is, is palpable and really to have, um, you're, right, you're right about the film with um, Hatija. She, she was around the bees the whole time, but we never saw her get stung. But, you know, the kids and the family next door who were new to beekeeping and just rushing that process um it, that was a big part of it wasn't it seeing yeah. them getting stung and the kids crying and yes you know and the tension mm. if you approach bees with tension and fear they can feel that and yes. if you think about how bees communicate they communicate through pheromones that the queen releases so mm. if i think they can sense human stress and human tension and whether it's I mean remember we thought it was a king bee until the 1940s so we're still learning a huge amount about bees mm. and we've got so much more to learn but before we get deeper into that conversation it'd be great to hear from you em Emily about your experience you're not a beekeeper yourself but you're certainly very involved in promoting habitats that support the ecosystem and make life better for bees and for all of us. Where's Emily? There she is. Hi. I'm sorry, something just happened. Must be this wind. Yeah. <laughs> be great just to hear any thoughts on the film and also just about what your work involves in relationship to, to bee life and to our ecosystems. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'd, I'd actually like to just start by acknowledging um, the custodians and the land from which I'm coming from, the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation, extending my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I think it's important to say this not just as a passing statement, but actually as a core element to the discussions tonight, because of course, the heroine is practicing an Indigenous practice in this film. And I think that is a really interesting um, dynamic because she sort of shows us these ways to live with nature and other species, of course, particularly with bees. But she demonstrates this, this a harmonious, respectful relationship where it wasn't a case of the bees working for her. It was about her caring for them and through that, getting a mutual benefit from that. And I think that is a really big message for all of us. You know, it's, you can take that from you know, beekeeping and extend it to other aspects of your life. Mm, absolutely. 
and it, it's really I mean it was it, it it's very much that you know that in, interrelationship between things that we're seeing all the time in the film isn't it and yeah. the slow the slow care that she's taking both you know for her mother and also with her approach to beekeeping um, I'm interested to know how different wild beekeeping is from other methods of beekeeping. Is yeah, that well, something anyone would love to talk to? Yep. I guess I might be able to start off, but I'm sure Lance has a lot more to say on this topic. Um, he gave that great example of, you know, protecting birds by only caring for chickens. You know, there's a bit of a, um, <laughs> you know, um, a disjointed view that, you know, with um, Australian bees, there's thousands of different species and they all have different habitat requirements. A lot of the native bees of Randwick might uh, burrow into wood or into um, clay and a lot of them are solitary, so they don't actually produce honey. Um, can you add more to that, Lance? What are yeah, your experiences? So well, so yeah, there's a few things to say there. So there's firstly there's um, there's a different types of uh, native bees, and they they go from highly social, which are the stingless uh, native bees that we have, and we've got about eleven different species in Australia. Probably only two or three get around to Sydney level. Most of them are tropical, and um, but we, yeah, as you said, there's two thousand species of other native bees, and they have varying levels of sociability from sort of a single one that just makes one little hole and lays one little egg um, to ones that live in colonies with multiple queens, um, you know, and then there's sort of smaller nests where the, the one will lay multiple eggs into one hole or multiple eggs into multiple holes. So there's all different sorts of behavior and there's not a lot of research into most of the native bees. There's an estimated uh, well, I forgot the exact percentage, but there's a large number of uh, bees that are unnamed, basically, and, and they haven't even been studied yet in Australia. Um, so the 2000 figure is an estimated number. Um, but in, Austra in Sydney, we've got at least sort of 25 different species, which I mainly look out for, and we create habitat for those. Um, and then I've got the three, uh, at the moment, it's just two different types of the stingless uh, colonies. Um, so the traditional uh, Aboriginal people would keep the, uh, they, they wouldn't necessarily um, keep bees as such. They would just sort of find, the, they call them sugar bag, the, the stingless bees, and they'd find the colonies and then they'd probably open them up, take some of the honey, and then the colony would just sort of rebuild. Um, and now what's happened is that we've got a bit of science behind it as well. We've figured out ways to split the, the colonies and to breed them and, you know, to sort of care for them more. Um, so give them better habitats and, you know, give them, um, you know, give them a better footing in the door, I guess. Mm. So. so it's interesting that we've got so many different species of native bees that are really important for the ecosystem and biodiversity. And then we've also got the honeybees, which is traditionally where we're pollinating and they came here to, to help us grow the food that we're eating most of the time, isn't it? Interesting. So how do those mixed, based? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you the, if, sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, interestingly, next year is the 200-year anniversary of uh, European honeybees being brought to Australia. So I know that... Um, the RAS, the Rural Agricultural Society, have got lots of things planned for that. But yeah, basically the first settlers found that none of their food was being pollinated by native bees. And so they brought honeybees over to pollinate the European crops. Um, I know that there was, a there was a lot of thought that honeybees were... I guess, taking food away from native bees or that they were competing. But actually, when they built the M2, they found a log uh, during that process, which had, it was a 1.2 metre long log 
that had fallen that had a European honeybee hive in one end and a native beehive in the other end. And that's now a Taronga Zoo, still happily coexisting um, with one another. I mean, I mean, maybe the native bees would have something to say about happily coexisting, but that's my interpretation. <laughs> So there is a bit of scientific research on it and yes. there's a small amount of evidence at the moment to say that um, they do coexist. There is evidence to show that they do coexist because I keep yep. native bees and European bees together in yeah. the same gardens, multiple gardens around Sydney. So, yep. um, there, but at the same time, um, there's, there is evidence to show how uh, certain native flowers need particular native bees of course. to pollinate them. Yeah. And what happens is some of the European bees effectively rob the nectar from those flowers. Right. So without providing the pollination service for those flowers. Okay. And then there's, yeah. there's also other evidence to show that they, um, by filling in the hollows, uh, they are taking away habitat that would otherwise have sort of possums yeah. or other native animals living in those uh, habitats. So there is a little, a small amount of evidence to show that they do compete for habitat mm -hmm. and food, um, but it's not to say that we can't manage that, uh, you know, in, in the way that we operate. So, yes. for example, I, I do very similar work to um, what Habita does in the movie in that we only take the excess um, honey yeah. that's sort of enough to stop them from swarming, basically but we leave them as much honey as we can. And um, we really just keep them from pollination. And we also provide a service because we collect swarms. So we provide a service for the local community to collect uh, swarms, which happen around this time of year. Well, and you'd also be providing a service to the community by providing pollinators in all of Correct. their gardens. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. But there is also some research to show how native bees are actually being used in uh, blueberry crops and in um, macadamia. macadamia nuts. Oh, right. Commercially. Commercial. Yeah. So they've started using those commercially now. Um, and I think there's probably some others which I can't think of off the top of my head. It's an interesting philosophical point, isn't it, that, you know, you might go from thinking about bees and honey and what they can do for us to then, you know, bees wax and how we can use bees wax in candles to then kind of really getting into it and understanding that our survival depends on an ecosystem that's diverse and that bees play an integral role in that. So then it just gets down to the detail. I'd love to hear more from you, Emily. Have you, have you been waiting to? Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. I, I'd love to jump in here. So. I think there was a question further up about how to identify native bees. And the short answer is there's a lot of different varieties. So I think someone said, you know, native bees are smaller. That can be true, but they can also be a lot, lot bigger. Oh, wow. So the idea is just starting to tune in, see what is visiting your flowers. And if it has four wings, it's a bee. So there's some bees you can see on the poster that these guys are holding up. Uh, the little black silhouette is actually the life size um, scale. So some of the native honeybees are really, really tiny, but some of them are really large and quite spectacular. There's really bright, bright blue ones. There's fuzzy ones called uh, the teddy bees. Teddy bears. Yeah. Um, Probably the most popular one that most people have heard of is the blue banded bee, which you can see down the bottom corner. It's got bright blue stripes um, interspersed with black, and then the body is golden. So really quite a spectacular looking bee. And the, the importance of having this variety is because these pollinate the variety of flowers that naturally occur in our, in our bushland. So like the guys said, um, some of the bees um, are really closely evolved to pollinate specific plants. And there has been studies to show that some of these plants have declined because their pollinators aren't as prevalent as they used to be. 
Um, so I think my advice on this matter is, A, tuning in, seeing what's available, what's visiting your garden already. And also I think um, if you are looking at keeping bees, consider it just as you would any other pet. You know, they, they require a bit of care. And in our bushland, we have a lot of nest boxes up and I've been doing surveys of them. And I would say about 90% of them are full of European honeybees. So that is quite an alarming thing for us because we've put up these nest boxes for possums and for birds. And they're not being able to inhabit these uh, pieces of habitat. You know, we've actually seen evidence of some rare birds nesting in these boxes and then the bees moving in and killing them. So it's just a thing of like with any other pet, you've got to really be committed to caring for them, making sure that they're happy and so that all our other wildlife can also be happy and have their own places to live. What do you do, Emily, when you see so many of the honeybees in, you know, these boxes that you've intended for others, other species? Yeah, well, it can be quite problematic, um, you know, when they're high up, they're hard to get to. Um, so often we'll call some of the guys from the Sydney Bee Club to help us out uh, by collecting and rehoming the swarms. That's our main sort of um, action there, yeah. Can you go with a different shape or size? <laughs> my any, any of them. So I think, I think what we've seen in recent years is the popularity of beekeeping has just skyrocketed, which I think is awesome. I think it's such a great way to start connecting with nature. Um, but I think that there is potentially a lot of people who start it thinking, mm. oh, I'll just set this up and forget it. And I think that's where the problem comes in. So we've seen evidence of, you know, there might be five nest, nest boxes all inhabited by bees and then the bees are just swarming inside bollards, just out in the open, which is very unusual. So, yeah, clearly there's this, there's this sort of emerging issue. Mm. Was it hard for you all to start up your own beehives? For the first time, Kate, you did yours on a balcony in Sydney. So How did you I, get into that? Well, interestingly, and this, I guess, is one of the issues that it would be interesting to hear from the council's perspective. I, because I was doing it with Bruce, who had been an APRES officer for 43 years, for me, it was really quite simple. I filled in the form and Bruce got me a beehive and then it grew to two beehives. Um, I didn't tell the strata and I only ever told my neighbours beneath me because often if bees come back with a fully laden with nectar, they might land lower and then fly up to their hive. Um, I had 80 year old neighbours under me who absolutely adored bees and I gave them lots of honey and they were just divine. I had the head of the strata who lived on top of me, so I just didn't tell him. And unfortunately, I had another neighbour whose hay fever was cured eating a local honey, and she mentioned to a neighbour who was sneezing, oh, you must get some honey from Kate because it will fix your allergies. And so the bee was out of the cage, so to speak, and all of a sudden my bees were dangerous. Even though the head of the strata lived on top of me and didn't know for five years. Mm. So there's, I feel as if there is an uncomfortable tension with beekeeping in the city. Um, there's a way of managing bees in the city. So I think my particular circumstances where I had no neighbours where the bees fly you know, worked. I've seen beekeepers in really dense areas that put up green gardening mesh in front of the hive so that the bees have to fly up two metres and fly out, and that way you're keeping them off a human level. Um, I know that the Department of Primary Industries handled disputes with neighbours. 
and they will have an opinion on whether you have too many beehives for your backyard or whatever area you've got them in. Lance, you're nodding with a big smile. Can you speak to this? Oh, uh, yeah, because we, we're in Bondi. So yes. I've had quite a few uh, visits from the DPI. But fortunately, um, they're very uh, very cooperative. And as long as you do what they say, then it's all yes. good. So we still have two hives uh, in Bondi and we've got two in Bellevue Hill and two in Watson's Bay. And then we've got two in Wentworth Falls. So yeah. those are all the European hives. And then we've got about 15 uh, tetragonular carbonaria hives. And then we've yeah. got a couple of tetragonular hockingsai and astroplevia. And then the rest of the hives we do uh, are not really hives. They're just habitats. So yeah. it's like, um, mm. you know, the mud habitats or the yeah. various size sticks or the logs with holes in them. Yeah. But, but we do exp experience complaints from the neighbours. Yes. Well, we Initially, yeah. yeah. After those we've dealt with, then that's it. They Emily, and... can you speak from the council perspective? Do you get a lot of complaints about beehives? Yeah, so not too many complaints come directly to me because the DPI is the regulatory okay. authority on this. But we do have people, a lot of people kind of interested in getting started and then a lot of people being like, oh, my neighbours is are doing this thing that is scary um so I can sort of see you know both sides of it and I think I don't know in the film there's this beautiful scene where uh Hetsi, she, yeah, no, she um she doesn't get stung because she just operates with such care with them and it's only when the neighbors are sort of demanding more honey than they're due and going about it in an aggressive way that they actually stimulate the bees to become aggressive and I think there is some, like, a really important lesson here to, to the people, you know, across society, whether they want to be beekeepers or whether the neighbours want to be beekeepers, about, you know, just taking a bit more care to understand these relationships and to approach them in the right way, I think. Mm. I think generosity goes a long way <laughs> too. Yeah. I really do. Like, uh, to, in my experience, there's not a lot that can't be solved with a jar of honey. <laughs> Honestly, like people, particularly a local honey, mm. you know, it's just a floral dance party in your mouth. Like, it's incredible when you get a local honey. And so, I, and I think that was the thing with Hattager's way of beekeeping. She was very generous with the bees, generous with the neighbours, generous with her mother. You know, everything about her was this naive generosity. Mm -hmm. Lance and Gloria, do you have any sort of insights into caring for bees? And if, if people want to get into beekeeping, like what, how they should get started, if there's a particular type of hive. And I mean, taking this approach really makes a lot of sense to, to really, and, and the benefits of that are really that you get to get into a mindfulness around beekeeping. It sounds like it goes on and on, but in terms of the level of yes. care required and any tips? So because there's 2000 different species of bees, there's 2000 different levels of care that can be given for each of the species. So actually some of them are as low maintenance as, you know, putting a bunch of sticks in the tree or a few bunches around the garden. Um, there's specific measurements and sizes for yeah. different bees. So um, once you just, you know, you work out which size sticks to put in, you can do that or making a few like uh, mud bricks inside some poly pipe or down pipe or something. So that just gives little spaces for certain nesting bees who would burrow into sand. Um, they can, and then once you, uh, sorry, they can have a habitat. And then once you, you've set up those, there's very low maintenance, just, you know, watch out for when they arrive and that kind of thing. And then with the stingless bees, they're also very low maintenance, the native ones. Um, in fact, the more you leave them alone, the, yeah, the tetragonular carbonarias, yeah. uh, they're very tiny little stingless black bees. They're fun to have around. You can have them right outside your front door. Um, they, those are quite low maintenance as well. Um, the less you disturb them, the better usually just because of how little is known about them. Um, so, uh, and then, um, it goes, there's quite a big jump <coughs> going from the native bees to keeping 
European bees, of course, because keeping European bees, uh, especially this time of year, it's like fortnightly checking mm. of all the broods, make sure that they're not going to swarm. Um, mm. And then in winter, you have to make sure they have enough uh, reserves of honey to, to make sure that they'll get through. You need to be checking at least monthly for uh, various diseases. Um, and then, you know, if you do get a certain type, certain diseases, you do need to report it to the DPI. Um, so there's a very high level, a jump to go from caring for native bees to caring for European bees. Mm. Um, and do you, do you find that people are sort of going more for the, the European bees if they're interested in honey and going more for the native bees if they're more broadly interested in promoting our ecosystem's health? Yeah, so... Um, I, I try and recommend the native bees just because they are much lower maintenance for people. But as you, as you sort of pointed out, they, they don't produce much honey. Um, what they produce is a much runnier version of honey. It's much more uh, higher water content. And so, and they only produce probably half a kilo a year, if, if that at the most. Um, whereas European bees in Sydney can produce, you know, upwards of 50 to 100 kilos a year of uh, honey per hive so um really the only way to get significant honey is to go for the honey bees i don't um rob honey from any of the native bees i leave that all for them because we have uh plenty of honey that comes from the european bees mm. yeah so and just, are, are both the bee populations of native bees and honey bees in decline or is it just the native uh, bees honey bees actually honey bees um has been going up quite a bit for the last mm. few decades. Um, there's no problem in terms of numbers of honeybees. Uh, Australia is in a very fortunate position that we don't have varroa mite. We're the last country in the world to not have varroa mite. And with that comes with a number, a number of other diseases. Um, but fortunately, we don't have that in Australia. So, so we're very lucky. Um, and uh, the number of bees hives and colonies for European bees is, it keeps going up just because of agricultural uh, practices and the need for more bees in agriculture. The number of native bees, however, is going the opposite direction. That's going down. Uh, and that's mainly due to things like habitat loss and climate change. So, um, you know, climates are changing. Uh, you know, there's been all those bushfires lately. Um, the, so there's a lot of habitat loss, there's the urban sprawl, um, a lot of land still gets cleared regularly, even yeah. today, yeah. for farmland. Um, so all of that kind of uh, land and habitat clearing, that is probably the biggest threat to the native bees. Uh, so there, were, there was a question how we can help. Uh, so yeah. apart from putting up habitats for the bees, the other good thing or the best thing to do is to plant as many sort of flowering native species as you can. Yes. Um, yeah. I might jump in there. <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that would be so fantastic. Um, I think we often think about like habitat loss as like, oh, well, the forest is cut down, you know, out, you know, there. But that also happens in urban areas and we can all contribute to bringing back habitat in our backyards yes that's and where also, we really really need it yeah the other interesting thing is um i do landscaping so mainly what i do is a lot of clearing of, of waste but i always i'll try and encourage clients to have one patch if they've got a big enough garden where we just leave it wild and i don't clear the wood away i don't clear the logs away we just leave sort of all the old bits and, and garden waste and stuff there because that's actually where a lot of uh, native animals will find refuge. Yeah. So Emily, with your work, have you, what sort of changes have you seen since beekeeping's becoming more popular? Is it fast enough? You know, what's happening? I think it's been a really wonderful thing to watch um, because I think as people get interested in having European honeybees, it starts opening up their eyes to the fact that there is also native bees as well. 
I think it's a really wonderful thing to see people sort of tuning in and being like, hey, insects are actually really cool. Um, you know, people like flowers. That's been true for a long time, but tuning into insects and how important they are for the health of that ecosystem is a really important step. Um, and I think it's a great way to sort of start considering habitat within your backyards um, because insects don't need that much space. You know, we might not have bandicoots foraging in Ran and Ranwick, but we have a lot of diversity of other living creatures. And bees are really easy to attract to your garden. All you need to do is plant flowering plants. Personally, I'm always um, going to encourage people to plant native plants because they're the ones that have evolved to our climate. They're going to be the easiest to maintain, but really any flowers. And um, the more variety, the better the result. And so what are we going to see then as more people start planting natives in their gardens and around them? Like what are, what's the flow on effect of that in our daily lives? <laughs> for for us um I think I think we all just benefit from tuning into nature a bit I think it's so good for everyone's mental health and I think um yeah it just starts sort of this caring relationship we've got lots of research to show that people who are in tune with nature are more in tune with their wider community mm. And I think, especially with this COVID period, we're all desperate for a bit more community. So getting out and doing some gardening, joining bush care, you know, meeting your neighbours and having these shared goals of bringing back more life to our urban areas is a really great, great way to achieve that. Mm. There's, it there's really, really, yeah, sorry. sorry, I was going to say, there's also the other benefits of cleaning the air, with oxygen and yeah. uh, having more green space and, and more trees also reduces what's called the heat island effect, the urban heat island effect, which means the overall climate uh, can be a lot cooler if we have more trees covering the area rather than hard surfaces like concrete and bitumen. Mm. That makes sense. Now I'm just being asked if we want to open to any questions. We've been running the questions just from the chat um, that have been typed through, but if anybody else has any questions that they wanted to ask? We've just got 10 minutes left. So does anybody want to... question about the lifespan of bees, I think. Yep. So the, uh, the European uh, honeybees, uh, the average worker will probably, lifespan is about six weeks, a month mm -hmm. to six weeks, um, from, from when it's an egg to when it's sort of becomes, it goes through all the different stages. The queen can last a few years. Um, and then for the native bees, their lifespans, I think about eight to 12 weeks even. Um, and it depends whether they male or females, you know, the drones or the, or the worker bees. And uh, the queen also can last, I believe, up to two years, native, native bees, the stingless ones. And then, um, and then you've got all the solitary ones. Uh, ones that I know of, they might have a, a six week to to i think the other one i know of is about eight week lifespan and they just basically lay eggs and then some of them will be seasonal so they'll lay eggs and then the, the eggs will hatch sort of the following season mm. thanks for that was interest any other questions from anybody um yes um it's Lindsay Severn here i thought there was three very interesting subtle messages in the film one of them was the mismanagement of the neighbors and their hives and um pests arrived in the form of wasps and i thought the other was that she was calling the bees or sending a vibration where the bees were receptive to her Lance, because I saw snow, tell me, I would have imagined having hives in the rocks would have cooled the bees, but it seemed it seemed that they lived a-okay. -okay. Would they have really had a temperature, well, they would have to survive it, 
does that ha ha often happen in these areas where snow is? Do they do they oh. actually place bees in these rock stone formations to keep them? I might be able to help a little bit with that one. Mm. I think um, it's important to realise that she was using native bees. Mm. So they were there without her help living in that environment. And I think that's really why mm. native species are so important to protect because they're adapted to all these really extreme conditions. And if we, own, if we put all our eggs in the basket of one species and then we take it somewhere else where they can't deal with those different extremes, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, so if you compare, <laughs> if you compare the, the sort of our native bees in Australia, uh, the stingless bees that uh, the super organism, the, the, the eusocial, highly social bees with the queen and lots of workers that make lots of honey, um, they're all tropical. So they have adapted to tropical climates where there's honey all year round. They don't survive, for example, in, in the upper blue mountains where it gets cold at winter. They're only sort of down in lower sort of Sydney area where it's warm and there's pollen and flowers and nectar all year round. So, um, that's another reason why European bees actually do really well in Sydney is because mm. they don't have to put up with the winters. And that's why mm -hmm. we have so much excess honey that we can take from them. Hmm. Okay. And what was that cow dung used for? Was that to hold up the cone? Did she actually position the cow dung inside the rock to hold the comb up? I was think that it was to seal the or rock. Or to seal. To seal. To seal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kate. So the only other thing that I would say is to anyone thinking of keeping European honeybees, do a course first. Yeah. Yes. I think it would be really, really irresponsible to take on a hive of 50 to 100,000 stinging insects in an urban environment without doing a course. And the courses are fascinating. And then you'll have friends as well that can help out if you have a problem. So not only will the course be incredible and you'll probably love it, but you will have a lot more success in being a good beekeeper, practicing good beekeeping skills. That makes sense. And are there some courses coming up with Randwick Council? I know there's more workshops through the Eco Living Festival that Helen was going to um, share details of, I believe. Yeah, so that's a great question. We do have a few different beehives at the community centre, but Julian Lee is actually in, on this call and that's really his um, area of expertise. So if he's available, I might throw this question out to him. Hi. Hi, Julian. So, yeah, look, we've got two native beehives on the walls in the, um, the Raymond Community Centre. Uh, we don't specifically run workshops because there are people out there who do that. Um, I'm not sure, Kate, Lance, Gloria, do you know commercial providers that might do workshops? Yeah, the urban beehives, uh, the urban beehives do it uh, in Matraville. They run workshops and they sell all the beekeeping equipment. Um, that's where we get a lot of our stuff from. Um, and then I think... I did Sydney, my course Sydney through TAFE. University. Yeah, or well, Sydney ago. University is another one, a two-day course. It's $168, and I believe November is for two days, and it starts 9.30, finishes at 12.30, Saturday wow. and Sunday. And it's and the, been going for a while. The Department mm. of Primary Industries, I think, also run... Uh, beginners courses. Toko College. Toko College, that's Toko right. College. And there's also a lot of amateur bee clubs in Sydney. So if you Google uh, Amateur Beekeepers Association, you would find, like I know Sutherland Bee Garden run courses for people down in Sutherland. I'm pretty sure the Northern Beaches also run them. Um, and I'm sure the Randwick would have things that go on at various times of the year but just stay in tune with what's going on through your amateur bee cubs. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you if you're in Sydney, you can join Sydney B Club. So we have regular field day where we open the hive and do rec- inspection, or we have in Randwick in Randwick the eco hub as well. So also we have regular meetings where you have questions you can ask the um, experienced apiarists, and um, or we have different topics every month as well. And sometimes we invite speakers. So just join the B Club and you have your questions answered. And it's always good to know other beekeepers if you want to keep bees. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This might be a really good time to um, plug. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Dude. It's pretty much time to wrap up. And I know we're going to um, be ending this with some details of an upcoming workshop on Sunday, I believe, isn't it, Helen? Oh, yes. Uh, the workshop's on Sunday, but I think Lance can uh, answer that. Uh, it's, uh, is it the, the two, Sydney 2 p.m.? Club? Yeah. yeah oh. we're, if we're, uh, hopefully, we'll be opening the hive. So Olivier from the Sydney Bee Club will be opening up the hive and live, uh, live I think it's a live stream. Mm. Um, but it's um, just weather dependent. So there's a possibility it might rain on Sunday. Oh. After five. Yeah. If it rains, it's not a good time to open the hive yeah, but because uh, we want all the bees to be out foraging in good weather when we open the hive. Um, so we have less, you know, destruction that we end up yeah. causing. Mm. Uh, there's another, actually, uh, sorry, there's another event uh, happening uh, on Saturday afternoon called Backyard Bugs, oh. if you want to book in for that as well, which also looks at the different insects as pollinators and what we find in our backyards. Mm. I think we're going to need to get, we've reached out, the bell's going, ding, ding, ding. Um, <laughs> just wanted to thank you all, Emily, Kate, Gloria, Lance, and all of you who joined in the discussion tonight. I hope you found it really interesting and inspiring. Um, I know just listening in and being part of this, I, I feel really curious and wanting to get more connected to the place that I live in. and. Um, you know, it's appropriate that we start the discussion with paying respects to the traditional owners. And we've Honeyland was very much about um, a traditional way of living in harmony with the land and, and really getting to know that. So, you know, the fact that you've opened up beekeeping as a, as a way to become more connected at a time that we a lot of us are feeling disconnected and also highlighted a lot of the different um, benefits that we might feel. Um, and just that the ecosystem will will feel from having um, having that attention paid. So, thank you all very much. And I'll hand you over to Helen because I believe we're going to just be um, sharing details to end up. Uh, yes, so I'm just going to share. Uh, so, thank you very much, Blanche and Kate and Lance and Gloria and Emily so much and Julian. Uh, such uh, a rich conversation and you know I think that one of the things that I took away from that about is that that meditation and that appreciation of nature you know that we often don't experience as much being in this urban environment and with our busy lives. Uh, so just to let you know that we um, at Rama Council we have uh, uh, quite a few programs that you can get involved in um, particularly the perma bees and the bush care. So Emily is involved with the bush care uh, with programs that we run. And, um, and also we have a program called Plant With Us, which uh, now that we're starting to open up and be able to gather outdoors, um, we are greening our city so that we can reduce that urban island effect and also bring back um, the biodiversity in our city. So if you want to get involved with those, please look up that uh, website, um, Ramic Council's um, Get Involved page. And, and also we would love to have your feedback. So please, uh, if you wanted to uh, get to the, to the survey through this QR code, you can. Otherwise, we'll be sending out an email with the link. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All of Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.